wanted to lift up a passage of scripture and just a quick word of prayer and just a passage of scripture uh, for what we will look at today and the next few days. And if we could just bow our heads in prayer. Search me, O God, and know my heart. And try me and see if there is any destructive way in me. And if you find anything that is not pleasing in your sight, place an eviction notice on the door of my heart and bring moving trucks and take it away from me. Cast it into the sea of forgetfulness. As far as the east is from the west, that it may never return again. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, you are my strength, and without a doubt, you are certainly my redeemer. Holy Spirit, do thy will, do thy will, Holy Spirit. In the mighty and magnificent and awesome name of Jesus, who is the Christ, we pray, and the people of God who love God may say, Amen. Amen. And I'm also so very thankful that we have this absolutely gifted musician over on the Hammond, on the Hammond organ in Marquand Chapel, on the Hammond organ on Marquand, let me say it, on the Hammond organ in Marquand Chapel. That is my brother, my little brother, Jeremiah Wright Haynes, just an absolute gift, and we just appreciate him so very, very, very much. I want to lift up the passage of scripture that was read so eloquently already, but I I want to read it from a different version. Uh, This is a different version. This is the OM3 translation of Ezra. Uh, That's the Otis Moss III translation, and that will be out. Uh, Dean Sterling will be editing that uh, next year. Amen. Amen. We're still working on the the whole book deal on that one. Um, And so just beginning with this, uh, lifting up with verse 10. Verse 11, let's go with verse 11. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. The Lord is good. God's love to Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord. Because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the elders... The seasoned saints, the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. Here is the remix in verse 13. No one could distinguish between the gospel shout and the blues moan. No one could distinguish between the gospel shout and the blues moan because the people made so much noise. The sound could be heard far away. No one could distinguish between the gospel shout and the blues moan. One generation shouting because they had not seen the former. Another generation moaning because they remember what happened in the past. A generational paradox, a challenge. Uh, One group trying to teach the blues, another group that was just ready to shout on Sunday. And here you have this generational paradox wrapped up in this particular text. A blues moan and a gospel shout. And I would contend that if if we are to reclaim the best of the preaching tradition, that we must learn what I call a blue note gospel. That before you get to your resurrection shout, you must pass by the challenge and pain of Calvary. What is this thing called the blues? It is the rue of black speech, the backbeat of American music, the foundation of preaching. Dr. Adams, blues is the curve of the Mississippi, the ghost of the South, the hypocrisy of the North. Blues is the beauty of bebop, the soul of gospel, and the pain of hip-hop. Many uh, academics have brilliantly placed jazz in the conceptual motif of preaching. Eugene Lowry and Kirk Byron Jones both brilliantly framed the importance of jazz to the craft of preaching. Lowry's Beecher Lecture, the book, The Homiletical Beat, takes apart the elements of jazz in relation to preaching. Jones, on the other hand, gives a motif of engagement and pragmatic structure to preaching and preparing with jazz as the central idiom for homiletical development. 
And it is, Brother Dr. Frank Thomas, while not explicitly developing a homiletical theory of jazz and preaching, implicitly pays homage to this enduring tradition, Portia, through his classic, they never like to quit praising God, the role of celebration in preaching. Thomas masterfully connects celebration, theology, and the emotive process uh, to African-American culture and homiletical practice. Jazz is the backdrop to his work as he shares the power of reversals, sense appeal, and celebrative design. All of these ideas are inherent in the construction of jazz and co jazz compositions. It is my task to give blues her due and shed light on how she births a jazz and hip hop aesthetic of preaching. Before we can speak of the jazz mosaic or the hip hop vibe for postmodern preaching, Michelle, we must wrestle with the blues. And it is that great uh, musician by the name of T-Bone Walker. T-Bone Walker who created that song, they call it Stormy Monday. They call it Stormy Monday, but Tuesday's just as bad. Wednesday's worse, but Thursday's oh so sad. Yet on Friday the eagle flies and Saturday I go out to pray, but on Sunday you'll see me in church on my knees to pray. Walker's song unintentionally lifted the challenge that blues places before the church. Stormy Monday forces the listener to reject traditional notions of sacred and secular. The pain in the week, during the week is connected to the sacred service on Sunday. There is no strict line of demarcation between the existential weariness of a disenfranchised person of color and the sacred disciplines of prayer, worship, and service to humanity. The Blue Note is a challenge to preaching and to the church. Can preaching recover a blues sensibility and dare speak with authority in the midst of a tragedy? America is living Stormy Monday, but the pulpit is preaching Happy Sunday. The world is experiencing the blues, and pulpiteers are dispensing excessive doses of non-prescribed prosaic sermons that serve ecclesia have severe ecclesiastical and theological side effects. The church is becoming a place where Christianity is nothing more than capitalism and drag. In his book, Where Have All the Prophets Gone?, Marvin McMickle, president of Colgate Rochester Seminary, raises the question, whatever happened to the prophetic wing of the church? Why have we emphasized a personal ethic congruent with current structures and not a public theology steeped in struggle and weeping informed by the blues? McMickle's book is instructive for us. Dr. Mickle demonstrates the focus on praise and praise and praise or the neo-chrismatic movement that is not, does not have the depth of theology. Coupled with false patriotism, enhanced by a reactionary development of what is known as the Tea Party. If I may stop here parenthetically, it's very interesting to me that the Tea Party recently started brewing tea. Uh, to the election of President Barack Obama and personal enrichment preaching, neo-religious capitalism informed by the market masquerading as ministry. The blues has faded from the Christian tradition, from the Afro-Christian tradition. This tradition is now lost to the clamor of material blessings, success without work, prayer without public concern, and preaching without burdens. The blues sensibility is not, is not, not in just preaching, but inherent in, Mer in American culture must be recovered, Dean. We must regain the literary sensibility of a Flannery O'Connor, Zora Neale Hurston, Ernest Hemingway, James Baldwin. We must have the prophetic speech of a Martin Luther King Jr., William Sloan Coffin, Ella Baker, and the powerful cultural critique of Jarena Lee. The blues, one of America's unique and enduring art forms created by people kissed by nature's sun and rooted in the religious and cultural motifs of West Africa must be recovered. The roots are African, but the, con, uh, the compositions were forged in the humid southern landscape of cypress and magnolia trees, mingling with Spanish moss. It's more than music, Dr. Hale. The blues is a cultural legacy that dares to view the American landscape from the viewpoint of the underside. It is Ralph Ellison, that literary maven and cultural critic, who states, the blues is an impulse 
to keep the painful details and episodes of, the brutali of brutality alive in one's aching consciousness. As a form, the blues is an autobiographical chronicle of a person's catastrophe expressed lyrically. My muse for understanding the blues is rooted in two organic theologians and non-traditional homileticians. Now, these names may sound strange because you've not seen them in any books in reference to hom homiletics, but I would say August Wilson and Zora Neale Hurston. This may sound strange for this lecture. It's about preaching at Yale, and when was the last time you saw August Wilson or Zora Neale Hurston preach? But I'm here to let you know they preach all the time. Uh, we, used, uh, we used names rooted in this theological canon that is usually given legitimacy, but, but, but both Wilson and Hurston capture the essence of blues speech and chronicle uh, black religiosity and the healing power of God talk articulated by people who preach and sing in minor keys. August Wilson, born Frederick August Kittle Jr. in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, is arguably America's most celebrated contemporary playwright. Having created a cycle of 10 plays for each decade in the 20th century, Jasmine, Wilson's work is written with an overt blues sensibility. He believed blues speech carried by his characters embodied by the actors has the power to save. For Wilson's speech wrapped in the blues is the antidote to the blues. The only way you get rid of the blues is you got to speak to your blues. It is his character, Ma Rainey, based on the real-life blues singer Gertrude Ma Rainey, who speaks of the blues' prophetic power to release the individual from spiritual isolation. And I quote Ma Rainey, the blues help you get out of the bed in the morning. You get up knowing you ain't alone. There's something else in the world. Something's been added by that song. This is an empty world without the blues. I take that emptiness and try to fill it up with something. Ma Rainey becomes a prophetic preacher with a deep blues sensibility. She is not seeking tragedy, but with a womanist vibe and a blues sensibility, she is stating, I refuse to fall into despair. It is through Wilson that I learned and the, the preacher learns a new definition of preaching. And here it is, blue note preaching or preaching with blues sensibility is prophetic preaching. And here is the definition. This form of speech is preaching about tragedy, but not falling into despair. And that is blues preaching. And they could not distinguish between the gospel shout and the blues moan. In his Beecher Lectures, Walter Brueggemann communicates, with, uh, with, uh, communicates and says that when we read the Bible, we must read and speak and think as the poet. The academic or the news reporter cannot understand the nuance nor conjure the power of prophetic blue speech. And across the landscape of the cultural topography of America, there are reporters masquerading as prophets. You can hear them, can you not? They are announcing tragedy, sending notes of folly and foolishness, crafting posts upon social media of the decadence and demise of our culture. This is not prophetic blue speech, only shallow reporting and voyeurism. Designed not to alter the world, but to numb your spiritual senses. Over time, you begin to accept what you hear if you hear it enough. You will think the real housewives are real housewives. <laughs> when everything about them is really fake in the first place. You'll think reality TV is authentic, and anything shot on high definition must be a documentary. Blue speech rescues us from the acceptance of social constructed reality and dares to move us from the couch of apathy to the position of work. We view the world in multidimensional ways with blue speech and a blue sensibility. We sing songs in major and minor keys and refuse to jettison lament from our vocabulary. The blues dares to celebrate all life and find the beauty in that in the midst of the magnificent mosaic of the human contradiction. In Psalm 137, the psalmist speaks uh, like a blues singer, uh, that speaks like a poet and a blues singer simultaneously, when the psalmist says, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept. When we remembered Zion there on the populace, we hung our harps. For there our captors asked for songs, our tormentors asked for songs of joy. They said, sing us one of those songs of Zion. How can we sing 
songs of the Lord while in a foreign land. That's a blues song right there. That's blues speech that, that gives reality to my reality. Though I am not to speak about my reality, this is a blues song. This song of lament and celebration dares to speak of tragedy. August Wilson was for, informed by this speech. This was biblical speech. After it had been translated through the lens of black culture, his work accurately uh, portrays the power of this communication. When we speak the blues and preach the blues, we reconnect with lost history and envision a yet to be future. All of Wilson's plays create and envision a world that royal speech, status quo speech, supremacist speech cannot imagine. A world in which autonomous artistic women control their destiny as we find in Ma Rainey. Or where you will find a mentally ill man such as a character in Fences demonstrates that he may be the messenger from God by the name of Gabriel. It is through August Wilson that I'm pulled into the world of the blues and through Zora Neale Hurston that I found the power of prophetic conjuring. Zora Neale Hurston, Harlem Renaissance writer, folklorist, novelist, spent her life recording the blues speech and patterns of displaced Africans. Her body of work dares to claim people of African descent do not need external cultural validation, but have a rich culture whether it is acknowledged by the West or not. Hurston takes the speech of Southern storytellers, preachers and singers, and peppers her fictional work with wisdom gathered from these people in order to create a rich tapestry of speech where blues, sensibility, and call and response moments are the norm. In Hurston's famous novel, Their Eyes Were Watching God, she gives a theological perspective by, with her blues sensibility. The main character of the novel, a sister by the name of Janie, uh, who takes hold of her destiny by marrying a much younger man by the name of Tea Cake, seeks to find her place in the world. In one stunning portion of the novel, Janie and Tea Cake take refuge from a hurricane, and the blues theology that Hurston has collected over the years emerges in the novel. Here is what Hurston says. The wind came back with triple fury and put out the light for the last time. They sat in the company with others and other shanties. Their eyes strained against the crude walls and their souls asking if he meant to measure their puny might against his. They seemed to be staring at the dark, but their eyes were watching God. The preacher's call is to stand in the storm. After all the lights have gone out, and all the tourists have left the land. Uh, the call of the preacher is to stare in the darkness and speak the blues with authority. And witness the work of God in the darkness and even in the abyss. Blues speech and blues theology changes the gaze of the preacher. Flannery O'Connor calls it the gaze of the grotesque in southern fiction. The writer, according to O'Connor, who is Christian, is burdened by the fact that they have knowledge of an alternative world because they have encountered a God of grace and love. But the world that they look at does not fit that which they have encountered. And so there is a burden. This burden breaks forth from the fact that the writer knows what the world should be, but is burdened by the divine distance humanity has from divinity. Their gaze is cast upon what is called the grotesque, those who seem to be out of sync with God and characters that demonstrate to be out of sync, but somehow the grace of God shows up in the life of that which is grotesque. It is through the lens that the writer is drawn to that which structure which is not right, which is out of sync, the grotesque and the blues, and God is found loose in the world. Isaiah with poetic power. And prophetic boldness speaks with the same blue sensibility. In the 10th chapter, he says, Woe to those who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees and deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice from the oppressed of my people, making windows their widows their prey and robbing the fatherless. The prophet speaks with poetic language, Dean Richardson, and lifts up the grotesque in the world of Israel. 
It is the prophet who points to the existential elements that lead to tragedy. In other words, he's speaking with blue sensibility. The policy of those in power who create the lopsided unjust world, the patriarchy of politicians who view women as objects for sport. Isaiah, the poet and prophet, has the same eye and same gaze and blue sensibility of a Billie Holiday. Because when Billie Holiday sang with such power known as Strange Fruit, she was singing with a blue sensibility. She said, southern trees bear strange fruit, blood on the leaves and blood at the root. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze, strange fruit hanging from the popular trees. Billie Holiday is not singing to cause the audience to fall into despair, but to empower all those who hear. But I will not allow you to cover your ears nor your eyes. That if we are to see a world that is different than the world that is now, I must speak the blues. I must sing the blues. Isaiah and Billie Holiday are doing prophetic work and taking the covers off of oppression. When the preacher refuses to preach, speak, and teach the blues, they unknowingly till the ground for more strange fruit. The blues is more than renaming existential darkness, but a way of seeing, a strategy of, a tr a strategy of knowing, and a technique to empower. And that is why Jesus is central to Blue Note preaching. It is Howard Thurman who first speaks of how we must view Jesus as liberator of the disinherited. In his classic text, Jesus and the Disinherited, he speaks of Jesus as savior and liberator of those who have their backs against the wall. But it is scholar Aubrey Hendricks who borrows from Thurman who expands our understanding of Jesus in his book, The Politics of Jesus. Hendricks makes the compelling argument to view Jesus not as the sociological savior of the oppressed people, uh, but as a normative view of Jesus, it must be seen as a person who lived a colonized life. Jesus understands the pain of terrorism and is acquainted with structures of disenfranchisement that rob people of their humanity. In other words, Jesus knows all about our troubles. Uh, the preached word when played, performed, and preached with a blue note sensibility has the audacity to claim Jesus as savior and liberator for marginalized people. The God of the blue note empowers men and women and refuses to be categorized by puny inadequate definitions created by man and concretized by anyone else. It is the role of the prophet and preacher to harness this portion of divine energy. The prophet seeks to paint a new world with a toolkit of oral performance, imagination, and keen intellectual investigation. In the process of painting this new world, the, poet, the prophet is altered by the weight of the heavy, elusive nature of the word she or he carries. We cannot help but be bruised and blessed by the weight of the sacred task before us. The word is so heavy that it leaves marks upon your shoulders just as it left bruises upon the shoulders of the Israelites as they carried the Ark of the Covenant across the dusty plain of Canaan. The word cuts and leaves scars upon the body, fissures of, in the mind, and we seek to handle that which we cannot handle. Listen to the words of such a prophet. Her name was Marion Wright Stewart. School teacher, activist, and preacher. She was born into time in 1803 and born into glory in 1879. As a woman with a blue sensibility, she, pre she, pre she was prescribed by society, but redescribed by our God. Her oratory spoke unflinchingly of the horror of being a woman of African descent who was designed by God as a gift, but mistaken by the world as a curse. Hear the words of the prophet. The frowns of the world shall never discourage me, nor smiles flatter me. For with the help of God, I am resolved to withstand the fiery darts of the devil and the assaults of wicked men. Blue note preaching is a way of knowing. We refuse to turn away from the beauty in the ashes, nor shall we turn from the ashes that were once a bouquet of beauty. She is singing is what Marion Wright Stewart is doing. She is preaching, she is saying, I'm African, I am black, I am a woman, I am displaced, yet 
from my sacred toolkit, a palette of colors capable of beautifying the decaying walls of my prison, I have. In the process of preaching, we unlock the gates of the prison with a word the world cannot comprehend. As a child, when I was small, I used to love a particular cartoon, uh, Dean Hamilton. I, I loved this cartoon when I was very small. This cartoon came on a, a romper room, and it was also, and y'all remember romper room, um, and also something called Captain Kangaroo. There's this cartoon. Uh, this cartoon was produced in England. Uh, it was about Simon and the chalk drawings. Uh, and er I can still remember part of the song. It would go like this. I know my name is Simon, for the things I draw come true. Simon was a simple stick figure cartoon character living in a colorless drab world. I watched Simon pull out a piece of chalk and begin to draw a new world upon the backdrop of a desolate life. Streets were formed, doors were created, ships were produced, taking him to new countries and new worlds untouched by any being. Simon's imagination was what allowed him to leave the drab existence. When we harness the power of that which has been placed in him by the creator or the illustrator, he was able to create a new world. Ah, uh, because he was given that uh, imagination. And it is one great writer by the name of James Weldon Johnson who pulled out his pen and said, I can create a new world just with some blue speech, something known as God's trombones. It's rooted in the simple task of the preacher's role is to create a new world with words, tones, dynamics, and blue sensibility. The artistic construction inherent in the sermon and the collective consciousness of the people create a healing moment to reconnect the fractured personality of a community traumatized by the institution known as human trafficking we now call slavery. The preacher who is armed with the word and shaped by the blues is able to create a new world in the face of the old world that denies humanity uh, to people of color or any people for that matter. Listen to James Weldon Johnson. And God stepped out on space, and looked around and said, I'm lonely. I'll make me a world. Johnson viewed the preacher as an artist and healer with the power to create through an imagination touched by the divine. The preacher functions like a cartoon, just like Simon. He's able to create something new. Weldon's poetry and the prophet Isaiah drawing with the paintbrush of the word, stroke of tones, colors of oratory, auditory dynamics upon the drab canvas of a broken world. Christ brings colors, tones, dynamics, and chords, and a new time signature to the world. You can hear, can you not? The sounds of men and women who had the smell of mud, manure, and magnolia upon their feet. They stood with dignity as cool red clay pressed between their toes and the unforgiving southern sun beat them with a continual whip of heat and humidity. Can you not see them, these unknown black bodies, tendons stretched beyond capacity and muscles bulging under the weight of rice, cotton, and tobacco? But somewhere between the insanity and despair, a new music was born. Spirituals and ring shouts and work songs and blues coupled with an oratorical dexterity the world had never seen. Can I get a witness? An entire orchestration was birthed down by the riverside as mothers sang, roll, Jordan, roll. Keep on keeping on, child. A new speech with conjuring power infused with an anointing that the West claimed did not exist among the people had stepped into the light. The blue note, the blue sensibility was born in this place of death that became the place of life. Just as Jesus hung on the cross and transformed an execution into a celebration, the blue note sensibility conjured life from death's domain. The blue note is the Africanization of a faith that forgot her roots. The blue note turns the gospel back to Jesus, the church back to Christ, and the preacher back to the prophets. Christianity was a prisoner of markets, manifest destiny in men, until blues set her free to see Christ's Calvary in the cross once again. The blues or blue note preaching performed by the artist of, of any artist brings a new vitality to the act of the performed word and the structure of homiletics. Preachers of African descent were born outside of the American project forced to gaze through the window of democracy. 
They yearned and wept for strange gifts that were on display on the other side of the window pane. Gifts with strange names like freedom, democracy, free agency, autonomy, humanity, the list goes on. The distance and yearning gave the preacher uh, of African descent a second sight. The preacher entered the pulpit, stepped to the lectern, eye upon the existential tragedy manufactured by a false anthropology and demented theology. The preacher witnessed a country claiming equality, yet birth in the blood of a holocaust of red and black bodies. The preacher nursed upon the breast of inhumanity, yet raised on the promise of Christ's eternity, is given a second sight. Born with a veil or a call, C-A-U-L, upon her spirit. Southern tradition claims that children born with a veil are given a second sight, a glimpse into the unseen, a world to the ancestors of haints and ghosts and prophecy and God talk. Blue note preaching, for lack of a better word, has a Du Boisian nature that allows it to penetrate the stronghold of the American mythos and embody the scripture with a renewed vitality not witnessed before. Blue note preaching does not appropriate biblical stories, but embodies the word. The text lives and inhabits the breath and body of the preacher and the people. For example, Moses is not appropriated as liberator or stand-in for people. Moses is African sociologically. Moses is African theologically. Moses is African metaphorically. Yet Moses is African literally. Uh, the brother is straight out of Egypt. He's H-W-A. That's a Hebrew with an attitude. He ceases to be the Charlton Heston or Christian Bale myth and inhabits the bodies of Harriet Tubman and Martin Luther King and Vernon Johns. The spirit of Moses transcends gender assignment in the Blue Note tradition. Heston played Moses on film, but Tubman conjured Moses in the flesh. This embodied action born in the crucible of American cruelty produced an ability to see beyond the mythos uh, of the American empire and breathe new life into the text. There was, there's nothing like witnessing when a congregation and a preacher all of a sudden become possessed, uh, Dr. Peters, by the word and the spirit. The entire congregation is, is possessed and something that happens that is musicality, that is a song. Because what happens is that the entire congregation becomes an instrument. It's called call and response. And all of a sudden you hear words like go ahead and amen, take your time. That's right. You don't want to hear help them, Lord. You don't want to hear that. You don't want to hear that. But it's part of the message of being reshaped that in the midst of the preaching moment, all of a sudden the message is being reshaped in the process. This action is collective art. The congregation paints upon the canvas presented by the preacher and they are able to join in in the mural that is being presented before the people. Whatever was written on paper is reshaped and reformed in the moment it is performed and presented before the people. This second sight gives Blue Note, Blue, Blue Note preaching a unique perspective. Blue Note preaching is not completely African, yet it is rooted in West African motifs. It is not European, yet much of it, and what it is, has, is elements of Europe. It is American, Creole style. Uh, it merges the best of the American tradition. I like to say it's, it's gumbo. Uh, Take a little bit of what is German, a little bit of what is African, a little bit of what is Spanish, a little bit of what is Indian. I take all that I find and I stir it up and serve something no one else has seen before. Ah, Blue Note preaching has shaken the foundations and toppled governments across the ages. Let me see if I can break that thing down. Uh, it is Martin Luther King Jr. and his very words, whether on the mall in uh, Washington, D.C. in 1963 or at Riverside Church, uh, Dr. Forbes, when he broke the silence, when he came out against the war in Vietnam, who caused not only the Senate, Congress, and the White House to take notice, but his words were so powerful that the FBI had to work overtime to disrupt and destroy the nonviolent civil rights movement. It is, not, is it not strange, is it not peculiar that, that this powerful speech, that speech has such power, that Moses with his speech impairment can say, let my people go and start a revolution. 
That Jesus, who is the word that becomes flesh, meaning that words are important in our tradition. And that isn't it not interesting that if you go to Washington, D.C., the only person who is not an elected official, who has a monument on the mall, is a country preacher who preached in Montgomery, Alabama, whose church was so small you couldn't even squeeze 200 people in there. But if you see now this stone that has been etched out, you see Dr. King not with his hands out as if he's preaching. I like the fact that he's got his hands crossed as he's looking at Thomas Jefferson and also Abraham Lincoln. In other words, I'm watching over democracy, these yet to be United States of America. And I will stand here as this stone that has been etched out of despair as a portion of hope that we will live up to our creed. It is with blue note sensibility that I stand with power. And Dr. King is watching over our democracy. And when we look at blue note elements biblically, uh, we see that Moses found power in the second sight. He was possessed with an intimate knowledge of Egyptian culture. From having been a student of Amun-Ra, uh, he knew the Ivy League culture and the Egyptian mystery system. Yet he was still a child of Abraham. Moses had a second sight of veil, giving his soul the power to see the true nature of the empire. Moses was what people would like to call a Creole child. He can recite the story of Abraham and sing the songs of Osiris. This was the section of his resume that caused the heavens to take notice in the words of Vernon Johns when uh, Moses took out that Egyptian with that brick bat. All the heavens leaned over and God said, get me that brother's resume right there. <laughs> I can use him to lead my movement. Yeah. You see, Moses was Ivy League and Urban League. Yeah. Moses was Mozart and most deaf. He was Handel and W.C. Handy. He was Rachmaninoff and Ma Rainey. His ability to understand the empire and still be faithful to his God was the root of his revolutionary power. To be from but not of yeah. is a unique burden and blessing. Maya Angelou calls it sweet brutality. To love the sweetness but yet know that you cannot be released from the brutality. W.E.B. Du Bois puts it this way, and I quote, The Negro is a sort of seventh son, born with a veil and gifted with second sight in this American world, a world which yields him no true self-consciousness, but only lets him see himself through the revelation of the other world. It is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt and pity. This is the tragic rue that is stirred at the bottom of the pot of blue no preaching. I see two worlds. I witness the schizophrenic nature of American pathology, and I know the remedy to my own spiritual bifurcation in my soul, and that remedy is Jesus. Jesus is so central to Blue Note preaching that it's accused of being Christocentric. Jesus ceases to be a past historical figure, a mere theological idea, a textual object for examination. Quite the contrary, Jesus is real. Jesus knows all about my troubles. Jesus walks with me. Jesus talks with me. Jesus picks me up and turns me around and plants my feet upon solid ground. Jesus is my heart fixer and my mind regulator. Jesus is a friend at midnight, a balm in Gilead, a trouble over deep water, bread in a starving land. Jesus understands my predicament. Why does Jesus understand my predicament? Jesus lived a life of, as a colonized person, as a minority in a community that was under siege by an occupying army. Jesus understands poverty created by an empire. He even knows about racial profiling. Jesus understands mass incarceration and is frustrated by the traditional church. Jesus experiences state-sponsored torture and knows what it's like to have a public defender who lacks competency. <laughs> was executed for a crime he did not commit and understands what character assassination is about in the media after one's own death. Jesus even knows what it's like to be stopped and frisked. Jesus is acquainted with patriarchy since not a single brother would listen to any of the sisters when it was announced, guess what, y'all, the tomb's empty. <laughs> Jesus knows all about our troubles. 
Jesus wrestles with tragedy but does not fall into despair. Jesus on the cross at that blue note moment but does not fall into despair. He forces us to face the tragedy. And then as the old preachers would say, a few days later, early on Sunday morning, Jesus got up with all power in his hand. But, but here is the thing that, that I must say that the one who taught me the most about Blue Note preaching was a little girl of about six years old, six years of age, my, my daughter. And here at, uh, when we were at Trinity starting out, we went through in a very painful and challenging moment as my predecessor was unfairly lifted up and attacked in the media because there was a person who'd been kissed by nature's son who was running for the presidency. And as a result, we had media outlets every day outside the church, but there were death threats, at least 100 every week, that we are going to kill you, and we are going to bomb your church. And you want to keep that kind of thing away from your family, but the stress was so painful. It was very difficult to even sleep at night. And I remember one night I was half asleep and heard some noise in the house. And my wife, Monica, she hunched me and said, you need to go check that out. So I did, and just like a good preacher, I grabbed my rod and staff to comfort me. So I went walking through the house with my rod and staff that was made in Louisville with the name Slugger on it. Looked downstairs to see what was going on, looked, looked, looked around, then I heard the noise again, and I made my way back upstairs, and I peeked into my daughter's room, and there was a six-year-old girl dancing in the darkness, just spinning around, just going like this, saying, look at me, daddy. I said, Michaela, you need to go to bed. It is 3 a.m. You need to go to bed. But she said, no, look at me, daddy, look at me. And she was spinning barrettes going back and forth, her little pigtails back and forth. I'm getting huffy and puffy, wanting her to go to bed. But then God spoke at that moment and said, look at your daughter. She's dancing in the dark. The darkness is not in her, but she's dancing in the dark. And if you dance long enough, weeping may endure for a night, but joy will come in the morning. And it is the job of every preacher to teach the congregation to dance in the dark. Do not let the darkness find its way in you, but dance in the dark. May God bless you. May God keep you, but dance, dance. Dance!